Being Brave, written by and read by John Katanj. Adam slipped on his long sleeve t-shirt, followed by his tracksuit, beanie hat and gloves. After tying his well-worn trainers, he descended the stairs and leaning against the passageway wall, completed a brief session of hamstring and calf stretches. He opened the living room door to reveal Eve, steadfastly focused on Emmerdale, her dainty fingers swishing around in a family-sized carton of Quality Street. I'm just popping out for a run, love. Shouldn't be too long. Eve gave him a stare fit to melt an iceberg. What? Not again. You've literally been out every night this week. I thought we could have a quiet night in. There's a decent film on once this is finished. We can watch it on catch up later if you like. What's the point? By the time you have a shower, change and make your hot chocolate, it'll be time for bed. Well, I've got a train for half marathon next month, haven't I? Oh, please yourself then, like you always do. Mr. Selfish strikes again. Eve turned away, snatched another chocolate and switched her attention back to the lives of ordinary farming folk as Adam made his way outside. It was late November, bleak and bitterly cold, and for a second he pondered whether to join his young wife on the sofa. But the thought passed and he broke into a trot, making his way cautiously down the street, his breath freezing as he exhaled. Despite council cutbacks, the path was well lit and, increasing his speed, he headed for the town centre, feeling the adrenaline course through his veins. He'd reached the outskirts when he heard the shout. Turning his head, he caught sight of a cloud of billowing black smoke and sensed the sharp crack of breaking glass. It came from a small end of terrace property and as he raced towards it, Adam noticed a sheet of flames emerge from the shattered downstairs window. He almost ran into a barefoot young man emerging from the house. Have you seen a black French bulldog, mate? I've checked downstairs, so if he's not outside, he must have run upstairs into the bedroom. No, I haven't seen him. Phone the fire service and stay outside. You'll burn your feet to pieces. I'll run upstairs and check. Adam yanked the tracksuit hood up and held his beanie over his mouth and nose as he raced in. The intense heat hit him like a punch in the stomach. The house was tiny, wood-framed, and no match for a blaze of this intensity. Glad that he was wearing his thick winter attire, he raced up the stairs and was met by two doors, both slightly ajar. One had to be a bedroom, the other a bathroom. He felt the flames licking around him and swiftly pushed open the left door, the bathroom. Slamming on the tap in the tiny sink, he rapidly splashed cold water over his arms, chest and face. Moving quickly to the second door, he detected a subdued whimper. The dog was huddled in the far corner alongside the wardrobe, visibly shaking. Come on, come here, boy. Seeing it was too terrified to move, Adam rushed in and grabbed the dog tightly against his chest. The terrified animal snuggled into him whimpering. Come on, boy, let's get out of here. The stairs were well ablaze and he felt the wood splintering as he raced down, almost tripping in his desperate haste to get outside and fill his lungs with oxygen. Suddenly, he was on the minuscule front lawn, coughing, spluttering, pushing the dog onto the grass and checking that it was breathing. He became aware of others around him, the young man on his knees vomiting, then the welcome blare of the fire engine siren. It seemed like a few minutes, but must surely have been much more. The firemen had extinguished the blaze, leaving the house a smouldering, sodden mess. The tearful young man was holding on to the dog for dear life. He came up to Adam. Oh my God, you are so brave. I tried my best, but I couldn't find my shoes and those stairs were well hot. I'm Josh, by the way, and this is Henri. I don't know how to thank you. I'm just glad you're both okay, Josh. Just sorry about the housemate. Adam hung around for a few more minutes, making small talk, feeling fine, a little light-headed maybe, but otherwise no problem. Then he slipped quietly away, oblivious to the shouts, and resumed his run, completing another three miles in a little over 20 minutes. It hit him in the shower and he shuddered and felt tears coursing down his cheeks and mingling with a warm jet of purifying water. He realised just how close he had come to losing his life, but incredibly, apart from a few scratches, and a minor burn on his left hand, he was physically fine. He was still shaking as he entered the living room. Eve barely glanced up, intent on her film and rapidly diminishing chocolates. A couple of minutes later, she sniffed the air. 
What's that disgusting, smoky smell, Adam? Oh, there was a house fire in town, but everyone's okay, thankfully. He attempted to put the incident out of his mind and even managed to get back to sleep after waking in a sweat at 4am. On his way home from work, he nipped into the newsagent and picked up a copy of the local rag. Glancing at the front page headline, he couldn't believe what he saw. Local man rescues terrified pup from blazing inferno. Do you know the reluctant superstar? Unsure as to how she would react to him risking his life for a dog, he made sure that Eve didn't see the paper that evening. The reporter traced him regardless, knocking on the door the following night. Denying it would have been useless, and the look on Eve's face was priceless. The paper wanted their pound of flesh, and Adam was paraded for the obligatory photograph, holding Henri alongside a grinning Josh. The local television station, never one to miss a good pet story, got in on the act, and he reluctantly found himself in the studio being interviewed for the evening news. He invited Eve, but she opted to stay at home watching the soaps. Hating the limelight, Adam played down his role. I did what anyone would do. I wasn't being brave. I just acted instinctively, and I'm delighted that little Henri is fine. Once off air, he managed to chat with Josh, who insisted on giving him a man hug. I don't care what you said. You are a hero. I was like a headless chicken, but you were fantastic. You saved Henri's life, and I'll never forget that. I may have lost my home, but thanks to you, I've got the most precious thing in my life. Honestly, it was nothing. Anyone would have done the same. So where are you staying now? So I'm back with my mum, temporarily, hopefully. The insurance think it was an electrical problem, so I'm hoping they'll sort it quickly. Adam ended up giving Josh and Henri a lift home to save him waiting for the bus. He found Josh easy to talk to, friendly, and clearly in awe of someone he regarded as a true-life hero. Eventually, they arrived at Josh's mother's quiet suburban bungalow. Well, I hope your luck improves, Josh, and that everything gets sorted quickly with the claim. Oh, thanks. It's been a terrible experience, but we'll get by somehow. I'm sure my mum can help me out until the claim's settled. I still don't know how to thank you, Adam. Don't worry about it, mate. No probs. As he drove home, he couldn't help but admire Josh's resilience. Although he is at least five years younger than Adam's 32, he exuded an energy that belied his small stature. No matter how hard Adam tried, he couldn't get the image of him out of his mind. The idea hit him that night after waking up in another sweat, the result of a nightmare in which he found himself locked in a blazing room. Unable to get back to sleep and unwilling to face the consequences of waking the snoring Eve, he stumbled downstairs and made a mug of steaming hot chocolate. His thoughts turned to Josh and he realised that he could raise some much needed funds for him through sponsorship at the forthcoming race. Adam was now something of a minor local celebrity and his running mates and work colleagues were only too happy to contribute a few pounds each, with the result that he amassed over £800. Returning to Josh's mother's the evening after the race, he was welcomed inside. A surprised Josh showed him into the lounge, advising that his mum was at her knitting club. Henri remained snoring in the corner of the room. As he handed over the envelope containing the cash, Josh burst into tears. Oh, Adam, that's so thoughtful. I know I'll get the insurance money soon, but this is a godsend. Thanks so much. He didn't know how it happened, but the next moment Josh was in his arms and they were kissing frantically. Josh broke away. Sorry, Adam. I don't know what came over me. I, I just... Neither do I. Um, I think I'd better be off. I I'm sorry, too. He rushed out and hastened home, his mind in a blur. Eve was in her favourite spot on the sofa, feet up, the ever-present box of chocolates at her side. Tonight the wool pack had been replaced by the rover's return, but her concentration was just as intense. Adam sat down and wisely waited for the adverts. What a cheeky cuppa, love. If you're making, what's happened to the run tonight? Oh, I'm a bit stiff after yesterday. I think I'll give it a miss. You stiff? That's a new one. Don't say you're literally going to keep me company for once. I should feel honoured. Now, now, less of the sarcasm. I might even help you with a couple of those chocolates and perhaps we can watch that film. Go on then. You make us a cuppa and we'll watch it as soon as this is finished. Adam didn't sleep well again that night. His mind was in turmoil. He couldn't stop thinking about Josh and that kiss. He tossed and turned and eventually switched on the bedroom light, noting Eve's tussled blonde curls as she dozed on, untroubled. He tried flicking through one of her magazines, but it was useless. His mind was racing, and he knew that tonight even a cup of chocolate wouldn't help. Suddenly he was back in secondary school, a gangly, acne-ravaged 14-year-old. Hearing another of Ryan Johnson's endless tales of his sexual conquests, I'm wondering why it failed to interest him in the slightest. 
gazing at the other lads in the showers and making sure his towel was wrapped tightly around his waist to hide the obvious signs of arousal. He'd so wanted to discuss his feelings with his parents, but sensed how unwise that would prove to be. His dominated mother just wanting the best for her only child, his rugby playing father, Mr. Testosterone himself, undoubtedly happy that his son had failed to show any interest in playing the sport of his nation. His 18th birthday, when he'd proudly followed his father into the local rugby club for his first official pint. The comment as he stood at the bar and supped, watch those two in the corner, son, bent as butcher's hooks. Tell me if they come near you and I'll give them a bloody good idea, the perverted bastards. You watch if I don't. So he'd hidden it, buried it somewhere deep in the Grand Canyon and tried to move on. A few half-hearted, partially successful fumbles with local girls. Then he'd met Eve, the daughter of his father's boss, and somehow, against all the odds, they'd hit it off. And here they were, eight years down the line, as close as two peas in a drum, both knowing that something was far from right but somehow making the best of a total nightmare. They'd never fully discussed it. Both just got on with their separate interwoven lives. He running, she seemingly content with the big house, the flashings of his success and the soaps, chocolates and occasional snide comments. Adam sighed deeply, rolled over and finally managed a couple of hours troubled slumber. He somehow managed to get through work in his father-in-law's building suppliers, but even his colleagues commented that he seemed to be on another planet. On leaving, he drove straight to Josh's mother's, Mrs. Parsons, left them alone, taking Henri around the block to do his business. I had to see you again, Josh. I need to figure out what happened last night. I just feel totally confused. Oh my God, Adam, I am stopped thinking about you. I don't know what to say. What will you, being married and everything? I fully understand if you don't feel the same way. Adam reached across and took his hand. It was terrific, Josh. I think that deep down I wanted it as much as you. There was no need for more words. Adam pulled Josh towards him and they kissed passionately. Then as he gazed into Josh's deep brown eyes, he realised that the self-doubt and confusion that he had fought with for so many years were now out in the open and that he had made the most difficult decision of his life. But even though he had shrugged off entering the burning house and genuinely seen it as not being heroic, he instinctively knew that he would have to be at his bravest during the coming few months. Unpleasant, difficult and hard times lay ahead and life was going to become extremely challenging. But gazing once more into those eyes, he instinctively knew that regardless of Eve and his parents' reaction, the disbelief and the potential ridicule, he had finally come to the right decision. The closet door was fully open, and Adam was ready and willing to emerge into the light. Mm-hmm.